everything that they showed you this morning, there wasn't a roadmap telling me to do this. Because if it would have been, it was, you guys are lucky, you know, if you're following, you know, this is, so, but I had feelings of how this could fly, and then, so the next step is, you know, I'm, I don't want to talk about the next steps now, we'll talk about that at the end of the, the show. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I'm not going to specifically talk about greenhouse production today because mm -hmm. you could find somebody else that could really teach you how to do this better than I am, can. The take-home message is that we hired a professional to teach us and it gave us a lot of great results. So it was an investment to pay that person. And um, we'll, I'll show you the systems in our greenhouse. They're super low-tech. But it, it involves heating the greenhouse, like big time. Like it's at 65 degrees all the time, minimum, even at night. Even now, if we were heating, it would be at 65. So there's a cost to that, hence the importance of optimizing your production. Yes? Okay, I love your question. Tarping the soil is not solarizing. Okay, when you solarize, you put clear plastic on the soil, and that raises the temperature to a point where it kills the weed seeds. But it also kills everybody that's there. On, with a black tarp, it's the absence of light that is destroying the weeds. So it's very different. So you're mulching, okay? And this is exactly a good setup for what I want to talk about now. We've researched that because of this problem, which was how do we do salad mix without having weeds in them? Because doing what she's doing now is crazy. This, this used to take us so much time. It's just like, this is crazy. We need to find another solution. And basically what I started to work with many years ago was that I needed to harvest two beds a week for my supply. So what I would do is I would seed four beds every two weeks. The reason why I would seed four beds was because my sprinklers would water four beds. And then what I would do is I would, when I was seeding these four beds, I would prepare the four other beds that would be seeded two weeks from then. And I would water these guys also at the same time. So I was watering my four beds and four other beds trying to germinate the weed seeds from these beds. Okay? And before that, I had a tarp that was also doing the work. Like, that would be uh, two plus two, six weeks ahead of time, I had a tarp. And I, I, I was, uh, as I was going down, I was just moving the tarp and preparing the seed beds and seeding. And that was all a sequence to try and eliminate the seed in the seed banks. And, and, and if I didn't have any successions in my garden, I would do this for all of my crops. So I would just, I would, I would be not a farmer anymore. I would be a, a tarp puller. <laughs> that would be my only job. I would pull tarps and then plant and then pull tarps and then plant. But these ideas were really good with me because I, wanted, I was also looking for a way to be the first at market with, with salad mix using the same techniques of using the six row cedar. And because we have some that are inside the hoop houses, but the transition from harvesting outside was always kind of like different because I, I want to have a steady supply every week. So what we came up doing is that we, I would take my best field, the field that is the most uh, Norton one, that, ha that has the highest grade, so the ones that dries the fastest in the spring, and in the fall, and I hope you guys will be able to follow me here, in the fall, I would raise my beds higher than usual. 
Like instead of being, raising them to 5 inch, they would be like at 8 inch or 9 inch. So they would be higher. So when you do this, they drain faster and they warm up faster. The higher the bed. Okay? So I would do that in the fall, raise my beds. Then I would put clear plastic onto these beds. That's in October. So the clear plastic, what it does is that it really warms up the soil, like big time. And then all the weeds, they germinate. And then they establish. And I would leave it for four weeks to really get all the weeds. Everybody come on in. It's an open bar. You guys are welcome to grow. And then after a month, then I'm in November, I'll put a black tarp over everything. And that will kill all the weeds. Okay? I'll leave it for two or three weeks, all the way up till mid-November. So that's clear plastic. That's clear plastic. That's old plastic from the greenhouses. Gotcha. Okay? And so now the black plastic over the clear plastic has killed the weeds. What I'm doing next is I'm removing the black plastic for the winter. So these beds are going to overwinter like that. What's going to happen in the spring? These guys, all, they'll warm up fast because they're high and because they have clear plastic. Like end of March, I remove this plastic. What happens when I remove this plastic? No weeds and ready to plant and it's dry because it's been covered. So by the end of March, I'm, I'm direct seeding in my fields. And then I'm putting, uh, I'm putting a mini tunnel and I'm putting a caterpillar tunnel over it. And the microbes don't need moisture? The microbes, that's a great question. What happens to them? I don't really know in the winter, but they're kind of, when soil is not warm, it, they, it's not really active. Mm -hmm. So this transition works pretty well. And so if you, if you followed through, so you, we're using the, the plastic as elements to enhance what we're doing. And so when I direct seed, I won't have any weeds because I haven't reworked the soil, bringing back weed seeds from the bottom up. So this is one example of where I think, as market gardeners, we should strive for. Instead of looking at weed control, why don't we develop things like strategies like that to prevent weeds from, from being a problem? You know, this is a picture of a calendar I took in France. The, the ultimate you know, farm I've seen, these were growers, they were working on 15 acres, permanent beds, tractors, and they were preparing their, their seed beds two years ahead of time for what they wanted to grow. There was always a sequence and these guys would never cultivate, never weed. They, they would use plastic, clear plastic, black plastic, and, and biogradable plastics, whatever. And just, they, they took care of weeds that way. Always like in pr prevention. Thinking two, heads, two years ahead of time. So I'm a strong believer in that. This was another kind of quick fix that we found because uh, you know that works. It's like a hand push finger weeder. That was one option. Tried that. And we transplant. We transplant a lot. Because we want to get ahead of the weeds, because we want to have optimal spacing on our beds. And when you're transplanting, you're pretty sure that you'll get the lettuce that you're planting because the germination rates is, is, is already kind of like trialed in the trays. And we, we transplant also because we're doing successions. I talked about this this morning. You know, we've optimized the, the, the area, the space, by intensifying the production, but also with time, by intercropping and, and having crops that are quickly replaced with. I have like a bed of radishes. It's, it's harvested. The next day, I'm planting lettuces. But I, I needed to know when the radishes were done because I needed to start the next lettuces four weeks before. So that four weeks that the lettuce spent in the greenhouse, it's like four weeks that I'm gaining in my season. I don't know if you 
Are you following this? And so that's why we transplant a lot, and that's where the, the, the calendar, crop planning calendar, gets to be like absolutely necessary because that's the only way we can manage to know, you know when to start things, where is it going to go, by what is it going to be replaced with, and when do we need to start these things that are replacing the others. So all of, things, all of this is blended in to the calendar. Now, I, I think we'll have time today, but I'll talk about the calendar later on. I do it by hand. Mm -hmm. So quickly, I wanted to run by you uh, our operation, our seedling operation, because we do a lot of seedlings. So the first thing is that we use trays, okay? And trays are really the way to go. If you want to be efficient, if you want to be effective, trays are, you know, they're, they're built for that. And uh, you have a chart that's pretty handy in, uh, in the Market Gardener, the book, because, you know, e each vegetable's, if they're growing in trays, they'll have their number of cell. So all the trays, they're, they're all the same size. So when you have trays that are called 72 or 128, what that means is that you'll have 128 cells, 128 cells or 72 cells, meaning that the 72s, they're bigger, okay? So each vegetable has its own cells and the set amount of numbers of days they need to be in their cells. If if you remove them before that, then the roots are not bounded correctly and then the, the, the thing won't hold. And if it stays longer, then it's, it creates problems. There's root bound problems. So these numbers, you, you, know, you don't reinvent. This is like 50 years of, you know, but, but this is interesting. Because we have 100 uh, uh, foot beds everywhere, it was easy for us to calculate, you know, we're transplanting um, beets. So I need 11 trays to transplant one, one bed. So I don't need to make these calculus all the time because I have this chart really handy, okay? So on our greenhouse, we're doing starts and we're doing tomatoes because we want to have tomatoes in early June. So we do, this, we do the tomatoes inside the house by the kitchen. We start them inside the house just now and then we'll graft them inside the house under shop lights. And then when everything gets to be too big, then we bring them, we bring everything outside and then we start the nursery of the seedlings because uh, we transplant outside uh, mid-May. So there's a time, there's a time thing there. And um, these are our equipment. Again, nothing fancy. There's a propane furnace, there's a backup furnace, really important. I've seen farms where they don't have a backup. And I'm like, well, what, what happens if this breaks? Uh, well, I don't know. Well, you need to know because it can go pretty fast. So you need to have a backup. And the backup should be cal you know, calculated to be able to heat you know, at, ooh, I'm not good in, in Fahrenheit. But, you know, minimally heat the greenhouse so that even if it's like minus 20, you, thing, things don't freeze inside. So just strong enough for that. This is a tank, a reservoir for the water, because the water comes from the well. And you don't want to water with cold water. You want to have temperate water, because the seedlings, they don't like it if they're like, it's like cold showers. It's like the same, same as us. So you see it here. There's a float, like a toilet float in it, so that it's always full. There's an expansion tank on a jacuzzi pump so that we're able to water without turning on and off the pump. Simple stuff. There's a generator hooked up on my BCS because if I have a power shortage, I need to be able to have my furnace operate. So these are like the, these are the things you need but these are not super expensive stuff and you can, with, with this simple equipment, you can generate super amazing seedlings. One thing that we found, and I'm going pretty quickly here, but you know, take some, leave some, but we found that it was great if only one person was in charge of watering because sometimes you assume that the other one's doing it and then there's confusion and you know, on a bright sunny day, if they don't get water, they can die pretty fast. 
So Modelen, she's in charge of that. She knows to put the 72s together on the same table, the 128 together, because they require the same amount of water. She knows that it's going to warm up faster on the sides, near the furnace. And she develops her botanical sensitivity by just being there with the plants, which is why I think like automated watering systems are not the way to go. You need to be with the plant to see if there's too much water, not enough. There's a fine balance. So, you know, you guys are, this is not, this is not high tech. This is pretty low tech. This is a great option to not have your hose always wherever. You just put it up there. That I like. This is not from my farm. These are my friends at Tournesol Farm. We buy our potting mix. Because I used to sift it. Is that the word? Like that? Like that? For hours and hours? It was like, oh man, this is a long day. And then one, one year I calculated all of the ingredients in my mix and it costed me more to buy all of them than to buy the mix made. So I was like, well, so now we have these big totes that are delivered on the farm and that <laughs> speeds up the process big time. Again, time is what we don't have on the farm. So every little thing that you can do to make it more efficient it's incremental. It adds up. And at the end of the day, you've got a lot done and you're ready to move on and just go for a bike ride or something. We, we have a plan. Yep, yeah, question? Um, as far as your, the construction of your greenhouse, is it basically the same as a peat house? No, not at all. And I think people should invest in better greenhouse structures. Because a greenhouse is something that, you know, you're going to heat. Uh, do I have a good picture? Something that you're going to heat. And it, it, it needs to be high because it attracts more light. It needs to be, the bigger you can afford, the better. Because you'll, you'll, you'll lose less, uh, you know, heat to variables when you open the doors and stuff like that. It's covered in plastic, double, uh, double inflated. I am not a strong believer in, in having rigid cores, uh, with high cores, because these plastics, after five years, you need to change them uh, because they get dirty and they don't get enough, they, they, they block the light. So you have less production. And these, these other high core that they sell you they'll tell you they'll last for 10 years or 15 years. But after five years, they're so dirty that you should replace them. So that's the thing. Okay? But that's like another subject. So this, this, plant sales, we make $10,000 in uh, four days opening the farm to the public. They come and they buy their plants for their gardens. And it's just about putting a couple of flyers word to mouth, and so that, that for us has been really big. This is a vacuum seeder. We used to put the seeds by hand in the tray, so when you're doing, you know, four beds of beets, so that's 20, no, that's 44 trays. That can take a while. So the vacuum seeder, what it is, it's an, it's an empty box. It has a tray with hole in it. And then the holes are marked to go you know, over all of the, 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 the cell. You drop your seeds on it. You start your vacuum. There's a vacuum here. It sucks the seeds into the hole. And then you can flip it. And the leftover seeds, they drop because they're not sucked. Well, they drop in here so you can collect them afterwards. And then you flip it and you put it onto the seed tray and then you shut the vacuum off and they all drop in the middle of the cell. So that like, speeds up the process like a gazillion hours. So that's called the vacuum seeder. Heating tables, big fan. Instead of heating the whole greenhouse for onions and leeks, we just have these tables and what they are, uh, uh, you know, they're uh, gutter heating Oh, I always, gutter wire heating cables. 
and they're connected to a thermostat and you have the probe inside of the soil so on your seed package it tells you leaks you know, optimal germinating temperature 77 whatever and then you program this and so the, the table is going to heat itself to the point where you have optimal germinating conditions. What's between the tubing and the... And the uh, you put sand that needs to be wet because it's a good conductor. So this is like a foam, it's a one inch foam and then you have this and then you have sand and then you have your tray. Okay? Uh, these are the, the word the <laughs> electrical. Somebody help me here. What are these? Yeah, they're, you get them from Home Depot. It's like I a gutter, gutter warmer. Yeah. Gutter, okay, so I'm not the only one having trouble with this yeah. word. Yeah. Gutter warmers. Okay, gutter. <laughs> gutter warmers. <laughs> anyway. It's like a heat gun. Okay, so this is, another, this is another idea. I'm building this this year. It's the same thing. It's the table like that. So it has the wire in it. But I've put these over them. And, and what these do, they're dual purpose. They have, they, there's a water line here with micro sprinklers. So I can just turn off the valve and it's going to water the table, but the whole table at once. So all of the 72s will be on the same table and I'm going to open the valve and it's going to water everything at once. And then I'm there and I'm adjusting how long I want it to water. It's not automated but it's faster than going with a gun. But why I want this is because I've had the problem where I want to cover this mm -hmm. with either floating row cover because it retains the heat of the, of the heating table or sometimes n insect nets for certain you know, insect problems that I had. Okay? Mm -hmm. Do you find that it gets hot enough? Like it's pretty cold? Yep. Pretty, it gets hot. It gets really hot. And, and, and when you can put a row cover, that's interesting. Have you tried other more commercially available? Um, yeah, I have the smaller ones, but they're expensive. <laughs> Might as well try and you know big uh, buy. You know, this is like this is sixty dollars, mm. and these big ones there there'll be like a couple of hundreds easy. So, yes. Yeah, wet, wet sand, wet sand is a good conductor of heat. I don't know why, but it's like that. Yeah, so you just, when you're watering, you're, you're also watering the sand. Just sand and water, you water the sand. But sometimes it's good that before you put your trays, that you water the sand a lot. Make sure that it's really really wet. Does the insulation hold under there from getting wet? No, because it's foam. Foam, foam is amazing. <laughs> it is. It's like plastic. It's like these materials that are like under the, if, if they're not in the landfill, they're great. Let's just put it like that way. Okay, so the next step is to bring, to harden off your plants. Like this is a step that I see people neglect, really important. Because if you neglect hardening off your plant, they're not gonna, whew, they're not gonna kick like they're supposed to. So we've, for the longest time, we've had this, you know, portable kind of like mini hoop house that we would build. And then at night when it's cold, we just cover everything. And during the day, we let the plants, you know, get different climatic experiences wind, hail, whatever, <laughs> and then they're ready to go. You see, and when we're doing that, we're preparing mm -hmm. that way. And these are the, the salad mix that they planted like two months ago. Mm. So this is the new design now. Instead of, instead of having something like this, which I need to take, for, you know, there's a door here, I need to take and move the, the new design is that this is the same but connected to the house and the roll up here opens so I can move the trays from inside directly on outside to tables. 
and I can open this during the day and close it. And if it's really cold, I can close this and open the, open the, uh, the roll-up so the heat from the house will go inside that shelter. Okay? This is the cart we use to bring the vegetables, the transplants out to the fields, and it's our harvesting cart. Notice that there's a box with knives, rubber bands. You know, I would put toilet paper, but the farm is too small for that. But that's something to think about, a shovel and toilet paper, so that the guy is not wasting your time. So anyway. Transplanting is a big part of our job. And uh, yeah, we don't have a transplanter. That's, that's one area where the veteran growers will say, aha. <laughs> yeah, we're always three when we're transplanting. There's one person that is popping up the, the plants from the trays. There's one person that has the ruler that is kind of like going faster on the first line and the other person is kind of following up. And we try to, we, you know, we try to speed up that process as much as we can. This is the seedbed, uh, the, yeah, the seedbed roller I showed you before. They've developed clamps, dibblers that you can put on it. And you can put them at different uh, areas. So what you're doing is that you're marking your uh, sideways and crossways by doing it that way. And these are like super easy to change. And so now, you know, the person won't even have to measure anything. He just follows into the marks that you've made. And that is useful. Let's say you're planting six beds of, I don't know, spinach. And spinach is like four rows, six inch on the rows. That's a lot of time thinking about where everything goes. So then you just take the time to install this and then vroom, 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 you mark your beds and then the guy that's transplanting is a no-brainer. Okay? This is like super cheap. I think they're like 60 bucks to get the whole kit and the roller is like 200 bucks. So it's, it's worthwhile. Again, all standardized to 30 inch. When we're transplanting, what we tell our employees and our interns is to make sure that the plug is flush here and flush here. So you don't want to have an air pocket here because the roots will have a hard time uh, connecting with the soil. And you don't want to have, uh, you don't want to have the, what's the word for this? Peter, the stem being uh, buried because most of these plants will get damaged that way. And you don't want to have the, the plug coming out because otherwise the, it's like if the, the soil sucks the moisture out of it. So it, want, it needs to be flushed both ways. Take the extra time, we tell them, to, make, to take a good job. And then we tell them that, and then we watch them do it, and then we're like, well, speed it up also. <laughs> it's crazy. Okay? And this is... A, this is yeah, we want it all because... When you're transplanting, you're doing repetitive work. So let's say I'm opening the soil with my hand. I'm taking the plant, I'm putting it in, and I'm taking both my hands to close it. And then I'm moving on. Okay? This other guy, he's taking one hand, one other hand. He's taking the plant, he's putting it, turning it, going like this, like this, like this, like this. And then he's moving on. He, he took like five more time than I did. And he needs to be conscious that all these movements, it's adding time. So we try to train them the right way, but sometimes. So be conscious of that on your farms. Like all these little steps, you need to think about them consciously because at the end of the day, it makes a difference. Yeah, we hire our employee. No, interns, no. Interns, it's just, it's kind of funny I'm going to say this. It's kind of bold, but our goal with the intern was to show them a farm that is not dysfunctional. Yeah. And so, so to have an immersion in a farm that it works and that people are happy and it's positive. <laughs> so, 
So, we, so four weeks is enough for them to figure that out. And they're not paid. So after four weeks, some of them are like, well, okay, well, that's fine. But our employees, they stay for two years. And after that, they start their own farm. So we're not interested in having long-term commitments because the pay would need to go up and we can't really afford that. And so after two years, they move on. And then there's always, it's the shoveling. There's one person that is leaving and the other is staying. And that's how we go. They stay motivated. After two years, it's more like a routine job. But you know, the first year, they're highly motivated. And then the next year, we give them more responsibilities. And then that keeps them motivated. Knee pads, like this, it took me 10 years to figure that out. I was having back problems all the time in the spring. And it was because my knees were in wet soil. And when that happens, there's a, there's a connector there. I don't know what it is. So, so uh, you know, a veteran grower told me, you're not wearing knee pads. And I was like, no. It's like, well, you have to. And so now I've, I've asked my mother to give me my old Tony Ox knee pads. And I wear them all the time, every day. So I'm going to put my pants, and then I'm going to put my knee pads, and then my boots. And when I don't need my knee pads, they're down. And when I need them, I just pull them up. But I'm carrying them all the time. And you should too. If you want to farm for a long time, it makes a difference. Is that specific to wet soil? Yeah. Yeah. Wet soil. And because it's sometimes it's hard to transplant in crouching positions all the time. So we do end up sometimes on our knees. And, but wet soil is a killer, especially cold, wet soil, which is when we transplant. So this is pretty much what we do. So people, you know, some people are not farmers and they think farming is quite sexy. This is like, these are long days. And so that was one area where I was looking for a way to speed up that process. How can we transplant faster? And two years ago, I found this. Perhaps you've heard about it. It's called a paper pot transplanter. And I, it's the most amazing thing ever. So I'll show you how it goes. The paper pot transplanter. These are origami paper pots. Check this out. Isn't that fantastic? This is epic. I'll, I'll, I'll discuss it after. I've, I, I'm still amazed about it. This is, this, these from, come from Japan. And it's highly intelligent. Very simple. And it works. I'm ready to rock, baby. Yeah. So that's pretty fast. That the drawback of this tool is that to get the starter kit is more than two thousand dollars with the paper pots, and so there's a cost to this efficiency. But once you have it, you can run many many years and speed up the process. the The other drawback is that it's not certified everywhere. In Vermont, Nofa Vermont certified it. Like in in Canada, they've ruled it out. Yeah. Because of the paper? Yeah, because in the paper there's a glue, acetone, the same glue that you'll have in cardboard, and they've ruled it out. It should be overruled because this is, for small scale farmers, this is the future. You know? So you guys are cool, you can use it, there's no problem. And uh, yeah. So then you go back and you have to No, no. 
the, um, it's just because that was like the field trial. I just got it. It was like the first time I was using it. And you can, you can adjust it as you go. That's one reason why you want to have your beds leveled. No, no, no. You just pull everything, but you can adjust the depth with, with the handlebar. So it's just getting the hang of it. And we've, you know, we've seen, uh, uh, I'm not going to redo the video, but we've seen some that aren't really in the ground. It'll work anyway, because the roots will, for these small ones. Like, and the, we use this for spinach, beets, uh, mini heads of lettuces that we use. You know, th those that are six inch, four inch apart on the row, it's a major time saver. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's for smaller. Yeah. Which, is, which was our problem because transplanting bigger plants, you need to do it carefully. These guys, you know, spinach, you can just kind of pretty much do whatever and it's going to grow. Beets the same. They work for onions also, but I've never tried them. What's the range you would have for the root canopy this morning? It's fine. The, the bed is raised, so the water will, will drain. You wash away the bed with it? No. Pretty cool, eh? It, it's yep. very cool. Are you able to use your vacuum feeder with this system? Um, that's the next step. But I have a problem. It's like I'm not certified. It's like if I use this, you know, if there's a there's Richard here from Quebec, you know, he's not going to tell. I hope, but <laughs> I need to be careful. Okay. okay. So so I can't invest too much time in figuring all of this out. In, uh, yes. Well, it's always the same. You need to have good seed bed conditions when you're doing this. <coughs> it's like the seeders that we use. A lot of people, they, they go on a rant about these precision seeders saying they don't work. They do work, but is your, if your seed bed is not well prepared, it won't work. So it's not the seeder, it's your seed bed prep. It's the same with this tool. This tool works, and there's a report that came out that I read. You know, five different farmers trialed that taper pot. And every one of them had a different opinion about how it went. And for me, that doesn't make any sense at all. If you prepare your seed bed for this tool to work, it'll work. So when we're transplanting and it's super hot, because sometimes that happens, one trick is to put clay over the leaves. The, this is called surround. It's a commercial product. And you just dip everything in there, and that will uh, limit transpiration of the plant when it's transplanted. So when, it, when it's really hot, sometimes we do this. This is a picture of our irrigation system. Fairly simple, but highly uh, flexible. So I said, you know, there's a main line that goes all around our gardens. And there's two valves per garden, per field blocks because one line waters eight beds, and all my field blocks are 16 beds. So two valves, and then these are the micro sprinklers that we use, low pressure, 35 PSI, and the, the line can be put anywhere you want, and you can go from watering eight beds to six to three or whatever by just adjusting the valve. And there's a flexible hose that connects from the main line to the valve. That's right off your well? No, it's from a pond that we dug. And there's a, there's a line that goes all the way from there to around the garden. And that's a great question because I talked about efficiencies, eh? Since the, 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 the pond is about 1,000 feet further down in the woodlot. Okay? And when we got the farm going, you know, the, the choice we had was to put an electrical pump or a gasoline pump. Gasoline pumps are really inexpensive. 
And electrical pumps are more expensive, but putting a wire that would go from the farmhouse all the way down a thousand uh, feet was about three grand. But we had to do this, no choice. Why? Because sometimes when we're doing, especially with direct seeded crops, the soil needs to be kept uh, moist throughout the day. So we have these, these micro sprinklers, we'll see them here. We use these, these guys water four beds and we'll water four or five times a day for like five minutes, okay? And so if the option is to walk a thousand, is to, you set up your sprinklers, you walk a thousand feet down to start your gasoline pump. Okay, pumps, they need to be close to the water source. Pumps are made to pull water, to push water, not to pull, okay? So your pump is where the, the pond is. So you go down, you walk, you know, I don't know, six minutes. You start your pump, and then you come back, and then you notice that it's exploded, like there's something wrong, the sprinkler exploded. So it's guzzling water everywhere. So you can't turn the valve off because otherwise the, the pressure will mount and the whole system will blow up. So you need to run, shut on the pump, and then you run back, and then you fix the water line, then you start it again. You come back, oh, it's not working, I didn't fix it, and, and just like, this is crazy. You can lose half your day just going back and forth. You can get a bike, or, or a motorbike, or a truck, I don't know, but the fact that now you have a wire that is in the ground makes it so that you know you could be at the warehouse and just open and close the pump on demand. You can even have it on your iPhone. So that's something to think about. Uh, uh, mini wobblers, the best. I would recommend these guys. <sighs> yeah. Uh, water hydrants. Below frost, there. if you guys are doing winter production, no choice, you need to have these. So the principle is really simple. Uh, you open the valve, water comes up, close the valve, water goes down below frost line. So even in the middle of the winter, you can water anything you want. I call it drip irritation. <laughs> Um, I used to farm in New Mexico and everything was on drip. The thing with drips is that it's good for water conservation, but it takes a lot of time to set up. And let's say you have like four rows of beets, so that's four drip tapes per bed. So when you're cultivating with your hoe, you need to remove four drips that you're putting back. And sometimes you'll, you'll put all these drips and you're not even using them because it's raining. So I, I prefer overhead sprinklers for, for pretty much everything, yeah. So I'm not really concerned about water conservation, actually. Because where I grew up in the suburbs, people wash their driveways with water. <laughs> and I'm growing crops, you know, sustainably. And I'm thinking, you know, it's, it's, I should be able to use water for that. So that's, and I'm pumping water from my own pond. And so water is spread to the field, it's trickling down. But you know, I, I, I don't want to get quoted too much on that. It's just like my personal... Because, you know, uh, organic farm, some of them, they're putting a lot of pressure on them, like trying to be like saints on many, you know, I, I want to farm without using plastic. Whew, you're going to have a hard time, you know. If you're not using water, not using plastic, it's just... It's, it's going to be hard. Yeah, we, we use drips for crops that are like 100 days under, under, um, roca, under um, pl black plastic mulch or inside the greenhouse. Yeah, yeah. yeah I don't want to sound too, too harsh, but it's just this is the kind of thinking, you know, you need to think about efficiency also because the goal at the end is that you make a living doing this. So people ask me how much water I use. 
And it's kind of, I don't really know, except to say that it was like a $2,000 hole. <laughs> and, you know, we pretty much, in, in August, it's pretty, it's pretty dry. And then, you know, in October, it starts to come up again. If you're digging a pond for your water, consider how much dirt it generates. It's crazy. Like if you're building a hole this size, like a nice swimming pool, well imagine that this, this is the amount of dirt that you need to manage. So you need to know this ahead of time. Okay. Any question with what I just talked about? Yep. I think that the rule is that if you water and it needs to be 24 hours before you harvest or something like that. Because it's for pathogen. But there's, there's a common sense rule. Because well, dig, digging a well to water a farm is, is quite a project. Because when you dig a well, you never know really what you're going to get. And it's like at least $10,000 to dig a well. So. so rules and regulations, they're great. But sometimes they can be a pain. So, All right, so now I want to entertain you guys on something very different. And uh, this is, if there's one thing that I think is super important uh, with regards to our farming success, this is it, crop planning. Like it, I can't imagine us doing the numbers that we're, I gave you this morning without cr a crop planning procedures that I want to lay out to you guys. So I'm not going to go in details, but I want to I want to at least explain the mechanics of how we do it and why it's important. Okay. So basically, we do crop planning in the winter, which you know I winter is the favorite part, my favorite part of the season because we're not working in the field and it's just like tranquilo and then we do a lot of the crop planning. And it's a four step process. The first thing is that we, we start by setting out our financial objectives. Then from there, it's like reverse engineering. We determine production, what we're going to grow and, and what quantity. Once we know that, we get a crop calendar set up that's going to be the guideline for you know when to do this and a map of where everything's going to go in the garden okay <laughs>